Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. This presentation is titled, What's Hiding on Your ICS Network? My name is Robert Landavazo, and I'm joined by my colleague, Zane Blomgren. We're both security engineers at Tripwire. Prior to joining Tripwire, I worked at an electric utility company for a number of years, implementing cybersecurity in OT environments and implementing a NERC critical infrastructure protection internal compliance program as well. Jane Blomgren has been with Tripwire for more than 14 years, supporting our customers in a myriad of ways. He has more than 20 years cybersecurity experience. Hello. Thanks, Robert. It's really great to be here today. I'd like to take a moment to briefly review our agenda for our presentation on what's hiding on your ICS network. We'll begin by taking a look at a set of rhetorical how do you know questions, which will allow us to further explore various ways to address the challenges they raise. This will allow us to move into some monitoring methodologies, which will help us answer the questions we raise and do it in a safe and an automated manner. Robert comes to Tripwire with a fitting background, having been a user of Tripwire in an electrical utility. He'll share some of his insights during tunnel vision, and we'll round out the presentation today by getting a bit into the weeds and walk through a mapping exercise to help you on your journey to addressing the how do you know questions in a practical way to pull it all together. Robert, over to you. All right, let's get started. Ask yourself, what are you doing to view, monitor, and control potential ICS cybersecurity events? I, for one, am a sucker for a good hypothetical and rhetorical questions. So I've posed a handful here and on the next slide. These are the questions I often found myself asking our security team, both when I worked at that utility and when I'm in front of customers today. More often than not, it's easy to find gaping coverage holes, gaps, unsurety. We ask things like, how do I know if a device configuration has changed? How can I identify devices with vulnerabilities? Can I be assured the current state of my systems meets specification? Are my devices at the brink of failure? And how do I know that my SCADA system is operating correctly? Now, even more specifically, we ask ourselves, am I harvesting logs from all the devices in my environment and correlating them to optimize visibility into it? How do I know what traffic my firewalls are in fact actually allowing, or more importantly, blocking? Are my devices configured correctly for cybersecurity hardening best practices? And do we have exposed vulnerabilities, HMIs, workstations, or other application systems in our environment? Ultimately, these are the questions we hope to address with the monitoring strategies we're about to consider. Those are some great questions, Robert, and they align very well with the security framework known as the Center for Internet Security, or CIS, Top 20 Controls. These security best practices are broken into three distinct categories. To begin, there are six practices which comprise the basic category, and they should be considered the fundamentals by which every organization measures their security posture. Following these practices, 7 through 16 are called foundational. These controls certainly provide additional security, but they tend to lean a little bit towards IT. While they should be reviewed as part of a security program, today we're going to talk about the top six. Before we leave the best practices, I will point out that the final four are organizational, where the top six really focus on technical measures. Those uh, in 17 through 20 are really focused more around people and procedures. So we've established a few things up to this point. There are a lot of questions we need answered to ensure we can find all the things hiding in our industrial networks. And it just so happens that a lot of the questions we need answered map really well to the top six critical cybersecurity controls. An obvious approach to solving this dilemma is to implement a monitoring strategy to do just that. We can lump monitoring methodologies into three main groups, which we'll cover now in a few different ways. The monitoring methods can be boiled down to something a little simpler. In this set of examples, we're going to talk about the three methods in a human communication scenario. 
The first communication method can be described as a direct conversation between two people. Zane can ask Cindy about the weather, and she can reply to him directly and tell him all about the great weather in Portland today. This conversation was done using their native language that they both speak and understand fully. The second form of communication is eavesdropping, whereby Zane can ask Cindy about all the breweries she enjoys visiting in Oregon, and she can respond in excruciating detail. And I can sort of creepily observe their conversation from a safe vantage point without interrupting them or alerting them to my presence. The last communication method can be described as third party. In the same scenario as before, Zane can ask Cindy all about her favorite hikes to go on. Then Zane can in turn relay that information to me at a later date. Without me ever having to talk to Cindy, I can know all about the best places to go hiking. Thanks, Robert. Those analogies really help. I particularly like that you called out the native language aspect. We'll see why in just a moment. Last year, I was given the privilege of speaking at the Industrial Control, uh, Industrial Control Systems Joint Working Group, or the IC JWG, which is an event which is put on by the uh, Department of Homeland Security. A side note on this, if you've not attended in the past, I would encourage you to look into the group's valuable resources or the two uh, events that they put on, one of which is held in the spring and the other is in the fall. Um, and at that time, I shared a candid assessment of the active versus the passive approaches and explored the notion of hybrid. So in a moment, we're going to take a look at those. Before we start, I want to mention a little bit about um, Tripwire in that um, we're kind of uniquely positioned with over two decades of experience in collecting data and transforming it into actionable information. So if you couple that with our parent and our sister company's leadership, in the industrial space, it's allowed us to leverage our technology to safely harvest uh, data from a variety of uh, different industrial systems, as we'll see Robert demonstrate in a short bit. First, let's explore active, passive, and hybrid. We start off on the passive. Now back to Robert's example where that was the uh, eavesdrop um, this would be using te uh, technologies like a, a mirror port or a tap. And it's effectively grabbing a capture of all of the traffic that's um, passing by on the wire. And then we're doing using dissectors to do um, deep packet analysis and pull the information out without ever having to um, interact with um, any of the, uh, the other systems. And again, this is kind of like the eavesdropping uh, piece. We look at doing active. So active is uh, introduced, and it allows using um, native industrial protocols, so BACnet or Profinet or Ethernet SIP, Modbus. And by speaking in these native protocols, we're able to um, more deeply uh, dive in and get uh, information from these systems. And again, I want to um, emphasize where Robert brought up the kind of native language it's important that these are, you know, appropriately uh, written so that they don't interfere or cause a, uh, an adverse interaction with the, uh, with the system that we're watching. Um, and these can, you know, be simple things like um, SNMP as well or um, port scans and so forth. So this is um, kind of the idea of having a direct conversation um, between two people. Then we can move over to the hybrid. So the hybrid, it gets very interesting because um, we're not going to directly interact with the system, but instead we're going to talk to potentially an intermediate system, or we're going to gather the information um, in a manner indirectly. So an example of that, you could, we could read a project file. And by reading that project file, we're going to get rich information about the system, about peers, about other information um, without ever having to actually talk to the, uh, to the endpoints. Or we can do integrations. So we already have some um, predefined integrations, and our architecture allows us to extend out into those uh, very easily. So an integration would tie into the DCS system or asset system, and it's going to extract 
information such as maybe make model version or configuration information and then it's going to go through you know essentially our analysis um, without ever having to touch when I've demonstrated this it's kind of neat because I'll do indirect vulnerability management um, and vulnerability assessment as an example and the main piece to to look at is that it's not one or the other but you're looking for a, um, a non-intrusive, a safe way to gather this information so that we can leverage this to you know, do some of the other things that we're, we're seeking to do. When putting talks like this together, I always try to put myself in the shoes of the asset owner, and this time was no different. Luckily, I have some direct experience in my past with regard to data collection methods in production environments helping us gain visibility into the unknown. What immediately came to mind as I thought about this was some of the things that really concerned me, specifically combating tunnel vision. I was lucky enough to have a significant budget to put in place the tools that our team thought we needed to satisfy compliance and security requirements as well. But the most concerning thing was always improving visibility into difficult to detect events. What keeps most of us up at night? You know, it used to be having good, reliable, and tested backups, but then it quickly became, uh, you know, not being notified of intrusions, being completely unaware of what we considered to be the inevitable. You know, while doing some work at a coal fire plant, I took this photo, uh, which really brought to life some of those tunnel vision-esque thoughts constantly in the back of my mind. So how do we combat that tunnel vision? And how do we answer all these hypothetical questions? And what monitoring methodologies can we leverage to, to satisfy them? We always look back to our CIS critical security controls. And we're going to start off with the first one, which is inventory and control of hardware assets. We need to know what's on our network, what's beyond our network, even in serial environments, and what's disconnected, and how do we go about doing that? When we ask a customer about their environment, typically we're going to encounter one of three things. We might get a crude diagram akin to something drawn on a cocktail napkin. Or maybe we're going to get um, an overly complex diagram and then uh, learn later on this thing has not even been um, updated in over a decade or last, we might get nothing, uh, simply just a uh, rat's nest um, of indiscernible, indiscernible information. Control One gives great guidance on how to inventory and to manage your hardware assets. Let's take a look at a couple specific requirements, starting with 1.1. Here, it's described as using an active tool to discover assets connected to your network and to update your inventory accordingly. In a plant environment, without the right tool in place, this may not even be possible or might draw some very negative attention from the plant manager or the plant engineer. We can see that in number 1.2, describes the usage of passive measures to detect assets connected to your network and, of course, to update your inventory. These may well be the two most important controls in this section, with one exception. And that is number six, uh, 1.6, the removal of unnecessary assets. How do you know what assets are present to have them removed? Robert's going to do a demo now of Tripwire Industrial Visibilities, or TIV, functionality in addressing hardware inventory. So you're looking at Tripwire Industrial Visibility now, and this is the assets view. And I really think of this just as our asset inventory. So I want to be clear here that we've obtained all of the data you see here from our lab environment, our industrial lab, and we've done nothing to uh, manipulate the data that we've received passively by taking uh, network captures off of a mirrored port on a switch. So all of the data that we see here that is populating our asset inventory was obtained simply by uh, eavesdropping on our network, so to speak. We can see that we obtained things like device host name where available, its IP address, 
its MAC address. We also add another layer of intelligence on top of that to intelligently determine uh, what is the asset's type. Is it uh, a PLC? Is it an endpoint? Is it an HMI? Uh, this isn't an IT tool smashed into an OT environment, but rather a purpose built for that. So you can see that we can uh, identify assets even at the protocol level and help us glean more interesting information uh, about the device by dissecting its industrial protocol. So what good is an industrial asset inventory without an accompanying network map? So we go very quickly from a napkin drawing of our network now to an automatically drawn layered view of our network whereby we drop all of our assets onto the relevant layer of the Purdue model. So we can see our controllers get dropped down into level one and our HMIs are in level two with our communication gear uh, in between those two layers. We can even do things like show traffic direction. So I wanted to drill down just a little deeper on a particular asset here. And we we're looking at a PLC, Programmable Logic Controller. Um, with regard to asset inventory, it can prove to be extremely difficult to effectively accomplish getting a holistic inventory, particularly in industrial OT environments. Uh, and that's because PLCs are arch typically architected in such a way that they contain rack slots and associated cards. And this example is no different here. So again, we can see our device information uh, to help populate our detailed asset inventory. It can contain things like uh, IP address, host name, uh, device make and model, as well as serial number. But we can also drill down into the actual rack slots on this particular logic controller. Uh, and in this example, I'm just gonna expand a few of these here to see that we can now inventory down at the rack card level. In slot zero, uh, we've got another device here along with its serial number and firmware version and the same. Robert, the level of detail uh, available is quite impressive and quickly shows that this is purpose built for the industrial network. Now with a great start on hardware inventory, we can turn our sites to the software inventory of our plant. So what do we encounter when we ask companies, how do you know what software assets are on your plant floor? Oftentimes, they keep the information on spreadsheets and have a wide range of ways to gather the needed information with varying accuracy. Worse, they're spending valuable human resources to keep the software uh, asset information fresh, and we see this to be true actually with the first control as well. Some industries face significant penalties for errant data Every organization, however, faces unnecessary risk if the information is not accurate. The other response uh, all too often is simply, we don't know. We have no real clean answer to that question. A few minutes ago, we looked at the hardware inventory requirement. Here we're going to look at a few key parts as it relates to the software inventory. We'll then turn it back over to you, Robert, to demonstrate a quick example of how this might be automated in TIV. We'll start with 2.1, which is really simple and clear in that you need to maintain an inventory of the software needed to run your environment. 2.3 is on the need for software inventory tool to collect this information. And 2.4 highlights the need for detailed information. And this is going to include things like name or the version, uh, who the vendor is, etc. 2.5 quite logically states that the software inventory should be associated with the hardware inventory. So Robert, can you show us an example of uh, control number two in TIV? So just as we showed a moment ago, we're collecting the firmware version associated with our PLCs. And that's relatively straightforward for the back plane. We can see the firmware versions included here. And again, it can get a little bit more difficult with regard to what slots uh, and cards are being leveraged on that backplane. And as you can see here, we enumerate the firmware version associated with each of those cards as well. Where it can get a little bit more tricky is with more IT-centric type systems. 
It's very likely that organizations are leveraging the Windows operating system to support engineering workstations, operator workstations, and other HMIs in their control environments. In this example, we're looking at a Windows device that we've collected quite a bit of information. Uh, not only just the operating system name and version, as you see here on the right-hand side, but if we scroll down here, we can see what actual patches are deployed on this operating system. Uh, and there's a whole lot of them, and they change frequently, presuming that patching is uh, being maintained. In addition to operating system patches, we have installed applications. And this is where it can get extremely interesting, uh, as there are a ton of applications that can be associated with any particular operating system. So keeping uh, an inventory of, of them and associating them with the hardware is important, as we learned uh, when we reviewed the Critical security control number two. Like how readily available the software version information can be found. After software inventory, we move on to continuous vulnerability management. When inquiring about a customer's vulnerability management program, we typically get quite a few blank stares. Um, and unfortunately, that seems to be the case, uh, especially in OT environments, because of the lack of desire to take an outage to perform patching to remediate vulnerabilities. Uh, because vulnerability management programs aren't just ad about identifying the vulnerabilities that your system has, but also remediating them by either performing patching or uh, implementing additional controls to uh, prevent a particular vulnerability from being exploited. Continuous vulnerability management seems to be a place where IT often shows a lack of understanding around a plant or an OT environment. Two areas of misunderstanding shine through the dangerous use of IT tools to actively scan the environment. Remember back to Robert's use of native language earlier on? Not only is it the language, but in some cases even the speed. Information overload can have adverse effect uh, and an impact on the uh, availability. So speaking of availability, uh, what highlights, uh, that highlights a second uh, IT misunderstanding around uh, patching methodologies. In the past, IT's patching felt, more like it, it, like, felt like it was more important than OT's system availability. No shock that this caused some tension. If you look at the recommendations here, there's a lot about active scanning and agents, which seem to be very IT-centric in nature. But step back for a moment, and let's see what can be accomplished using the passive methodologies, and it's pretty impressive. With the right tool and the right circumstances, active can have a play if done appropriately. And let's not forget about having the uh, hybrid capability, which does not directly connect to the collection tool at the uh, monitored endpoint. Let's turn it back over to Robert to give us an example of continuous vulnerability management. So this is the same uh, PLC that we were looking at earlier. And we can see here that we have some full match CVEs, their associated IDs, uh, and the associated CVSS score for each of the vulnerabilities that were identified on this asset by matching the make model and firmware versions of this asset against the vulnerability database. And so we can get very accurate uh, vulnerability uh, listings for each of our assets by just knowing enough about the asset and doing a proper asset. Critical security control number four is controlled use of administrative privileges. When I think about controlled use of administrative administrative privileges, typically uh, one enterprise class application comes to mind, and that's, of course, Active Directory. Uh, a lot of OT organizations uh, have not yet deployed Active Directory um, to their OT environment, and so they're leveraging local user accounts on uh, workstations and HMIs with auto logins. And so this is really typically an afterthought in controlling administrative privileges on this type of systems, when it really shouldn't be. Uh, this is, of course, uh, an extremely easy attack vector uh, that folks use to extract credentials from environments and leverage them against an organization. We're going to talk a little bit more about how Tripwire Industrial Visibility can give you insight 
into the use of accounts on uh, to make changes to controllers, as well as how Tripwire Log Center can help uh, give visibility into what's uh, happening with uh, account usage across the environment. Control 4 has guidance about how to manage the privileges, and in fact, the accounts themselves. Uh, one easy win is contained in uh, Section 4.2, Change the Default Passwords. This can make a significant difference for you. If we look back to 4.1, it calls out the need to inventory the accounts and to do this in an automated manner. And the last item I'll call out on the page is number 4.9, Make sure the asset uh, exposes unsuccessful login attempts. And let's take a look at what that looks like now. So this is an example of a PLC being managed by an actual user from an engineering workstation. And this can uh, give us insight to information about what our user's doing and where he's doing it from and when he last did it. So this is a great example of how we can passively identify what user is making a change from where and when to a particular PLC. Now we're looking at a report generated by Tripwire Log Center, another one of Tripwire's tools uh, in the solution suite. Tripwire Log Center uh, is a log management solution that allows us to pull in events of interest from a myriad of different devices, both Windows and Linux and switches and routers and firewalls, as well as tripwire industrial visibility itself, and just about anything else that can generate a log and get it sent over to us. So in this report, we're looking at uh, events by user. And we, we can see if we scroll down here that administrative accounts are reported on based on their usage, failed login attempts, access attempts, and other events over time. This can be a fantastic way to help meet the relevant parts of critical security control number four. That's impressive. And I can see how uh, powerful incorporating the login attempts and other data into a log management solution can be. So let's move on to number five, secure configuration for hardware and software. Robert, could you share your thoughts? Let me talk about secure configuration for hardware and software in industrial environments, especially in the electric utility space. We'll typically hear about an as-built document, design specifications and documentation uh, that were left behind by the original contractor or system integrator uh, that were how the uh, environment was originally built. But of course, as things change in any environment, modifications are needed to accommodate for uh, new processes or changes uh, to recipes or production standards. And of course, as those changes occur, um, typically what we'll see is an as-found and an as-left snapshot, if you will, of the configuration of a particular set of devices that may have changed as part of um, hands being on them to accommodate whatever change is happening in the environment. And this kind of manual methodology that's being leveraged to uh, document the state of the environment uh, is less than ideal, of course, for a lot of reasons. Good points and uh, perspective, Robert. So what are some of the areas we might highlight here? Starting with 5.1, we see the guidance of having documented configuration standard and logically, you might ask, if you have a build standard, how do you know the systems are compliant? Or uh, if, they were, um, if they were at some point, how did they, uh, have they maintained that state? In this example, we can see that we've raised an alert for a configuration download that was performed against this controller. If we scroll down, we can see that the engineering workstation in question is on the left-hand side that initiated this change against the controller that's seen on the right-hand side. We can see a whole lot of information about the exact commands that were ran to initiate this change. If we scroll down further, we can see the actual configurations that were modified as part of this change, so much so that we can drill down into a differences viewer to see uh, line by line what lines were modified, inserted, and deleted based on the color coding scheme we see. 
Control six. Uh, the last one we will explore today is about the maintenance, the monitoring, and analysis uh, of system logs. Earlier, we got a taste of the Tripwire Log Center solution, and no surprise, we will see how well it supports this area. Quite often, we see customers only looking at a limited set of logs uh, across their systems. And many times, uh, just logs which were generated by syslog. This presents uh, challenges in terms of doing good and analysis, as well as uh, leaving some blind spots. We also see organizations trying to use uh, basic tool sets uh, meant to collect the data in a manner to try and analyze the data with uh, limited success. And of course, some simply do not uh, collect all that much uh, log information. So critical security control number six. 6.1 through 6.4 do a great job of ensuring that you have some basics in place. Synchronized uh, time source for all of your devices, ensuring that logging is enabled and that it's being logged at the appropriate level to ensure that you're capturing uh, all security event types. And lastly, to making sure that you have enough space to store those very logs. Of course, where it gets a little more interesting is control 6.5 uh, through 6.8, which specify that you should uh, deploy a log management tool and a solution to assist um, with a log analytics uh, correlation and to help with the ongoing reviews that should be occurring for detecting anomalies and uh, abnormal events. And of course, lastly, the tools that you are using should be tuned to eliminate noise that may be generated by false alarms. But I'm just now going to show us a little bit more detail with Tripwire Log Center. One of my favorite things about Tripwire Log Center is the wide availability of content that we've curated over time to allow us to normalize a myriad of different log sources. As you can see here, there is a wide array of normalization rules available to you within the product. Should we not have the content available for a particular device that you're interested in monitoring, Tripwire can very quickly turn around the normalization rules on your behalf. Tripwire Log Center does a great job of retrieving logs from a myriad of devices. What we're looking at here are unprocessed logs coming from a Tripwire industrial visibility instance in their raw format. And because of that, they're very difficult to manage or report on in any meaningful way. Now that we've received all of our logs from Tripwire industrial visibility into Tripwire Log Center and then processed those logs, we can do really cool things like search on them based on a particular column name, for example. In this case, we're going to search for Modbus in the event name title. And we can quickly see, uh, once we get our results back, that we have all of the Modbus-associated commands that have been issued against uh, any of our PLCs in the environment. And we can see a whole lot of details that were sent to us uh, via syslog. The other really interesting thing we can do with Tripwire Log Center is uh, correlate events to generate um, events of interest, so to speak. In this example, we're getting a configuration download event from Tripwire Industrial Visibility against a particular controller, or any controller for that matter. And then uh, if, for example, we see one of our firewalls, in this example, a Tofino block uh, something at that particular asset, we can then fire off a database event. Should we also want to send an email should something like that occur? It's just as simple as dragging and dropping a new event here and linking it uh, to the decision tree. We can, of course, roll up this uh, events of interest that we've created into nice dashboard views. In this example, we're seeing configuration download. Robert, that really shows the power of our uh, broad security solution in the ICS space. So thank you for that walkthrough. Absolutely, Zane. Thanks for joining to me today. It was a pleasure uh, doing this presentation with you. I want to thank all of those uh, that joined us online for today's webcast. It was a pleasure. If you have any questions about Tripwire's solutions in the industrial space, please feel free to reach out to either Zane or I. Our email addresses are on the screen here. Thanks, and have a wonderful